It's been uh, truly excellent, really interesting, and it's great to see a number of lines of research uh, really taking shape that are hopefully genuinely moving our knowledge of tinnitus and surrounding neuroscience further. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say that we're on the cusp of something to transform clinical care, but it does feel like there is genuine progress being made. I mean, I mean, I think, I mean, starting with um, starting with causes, there's a huge and growing interest in looking at genetic causes. So, looking at the genome, uh, but also looking at the um, the metabolome, which is the downstream consequence of that, and all the different proteins and hormones and other things made by genes um, going around in the blood that are also influenced by other factors and lifestyle and other environmental things. Um, there's even starting to be work on the gut microbiome, so all the genes and the different species of bacteria well within the gut and other parts of the body, although it's too soon to have any results uh, from that. But it's certainly, I was surprised to see how much of a genetic component to tinnitus there is, which is not that it's inherited um, and passed down as a single gene, but actually that uh, uh, relatives of people with tinnitus, particularly twins, do have really quite an increased risk. And it's more genetic than I would have anticipated um, anyway, but I, I don't mean to worry anyone who's got it that they're likely to pass it on as such, but it's informative for telling us um, a, a little bit more about where it comes from. Um, still quite difficult to know whether the genetic links are largely through genes that affect hearing, and we know there are lots of those. Obviously, hearing loss, even very mild hearing loss, can be a big factor in developing tinnitus. Um, another thing that's come out is actually the relationship between body weight and risk of developing tinnitus, and it does seem to be um, it's not hugely, but significantly more common with, with higher body weight. And whether that's through the low-grade inflammation or stress on the metabolism that that causes, but that, that may be an avenue for future research. And then we're seeing the genetic and other links that relate to that uh, coming through as well. I think one, one thing that is really nice to see actually is looking at um, the ascending auditory pathway, the series of brain centers that connect the nerve uh, from the ear, uh, ultimately to auditory cortex and the rest of the brain. Um, until, until the last few years, there's not been a lot of research really clearly linking changes in activity there to tinnitus. Um, a lot of the time, the research would take some people with and without tinnitus but not match them for hearing loss or would take some animals and cause hearing loss and tinnitus and compare them to those that didn't have the hearing loss and tinnitus. And of course you see changes because hearing loss creates a lot of changes in the brain. But we're seeing a number of measures that do really seem to relate to tinnitus itself even when you're looking at people who are really well matched for hearing or animals where the same thing has been applied to cause a little bit of hearing damage but that really does better distinguish ones with and without tinnitus. And that's good because we're homing more towards processes that we might eventually be able to intervene with as a way of actually uh, treating tinnitus or that may serve as objective markers to help us really better objectively track and monitor the condition. Yeah, so, so I, should, I, mean, I should start by saying I don't think we'll ever come up with one marker that is tinnitus, but I think we're coming up with markers that at least give us a handle on some relevant processes that feed into tinnitus and are useful to try and monitor and intervene with. And, and so these include some of the older things like spontaneous activity and firing in the auditory pathway, um, but also some um, novel takes on this, like looking at how spontaneous activity or even how brain activity resulting from stimulation by sounds changes when you do things to the auditory system, like apply a mask of sound for a minute, the kind that would cause residual inhibition, and looking at how those change sound responses. And there seem to be some patterns that particularly distinguish tinnitus from non-tinnitus groups there. Everywhere. Um, everywhere is playing its part, and not just in the auditory pathway, but beyond, particularly when it comes to awareness of and distress caused by and consequences of tinnitus. Um, I think if you really want to fully understand tinnitus, you need to understand all of the mechanisms that feed into perception, result from perception, uh, which is one of the things that makes tinnitus so challenging and also so fascinating. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Yeah. So, so I mean, the, the interest in tinnitus and cognition is certainly growing, and there was a palpable sense of it. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say I saw anything new at this conference that I hadn't seen before on the subject. There's certainly a lot more talking about it that's going on. Um, we've seen particularly one study linking the uh, presence of tinnitus accompanying hearing loss to more preserved cognition compared to hearing loss alone without the tinnitus. Um, I must say I was surprised when I saw this finding first published. I think it's very exciting if it's borne out. Um, I suspect there'll be a lot of people who'll be very happy to learn that the condition that they may have seen as a purely negative thing might be conferring some advantages. I would stress this is one finding and it is just an association um, in a large epidemiological study just correlating one thing and another. Um, I'd really like to see this replicated in other studies using other methodologies in other groups before assuming this is definitely definitely the case, though. Um, but there are some nice lines as to how tinnitus might help. There's a lot of interest in this process called stochastic resonance, where if your input to a system, so hearing loss, is compromised, that actually the system can perform better if you add in some additional noise. Um, and there's a thought that tinnitus may result from this process of adding in noise, but that that may be conferring some advantages by making you better at detecting weaker or more subtle signals, but tinnitus may be a price that comes with it. And it's hard to say whether these new insights specifically do. There are ongoing efforts towards effective treatments or cures. Um, and I know there's, you know, uh, uh, certainly from experience and what I've heard before, what a lot of people would like is a medicine uphill rather than a really complex, laborious treatment you have to engage with that might suppress things. And there are medications that already exist um, and new ones being tested with some encouraging evidence from animal studies that they might suppress tinnitus. It is controversial whether what we're suppressing in animals is definitely the same thing. But there are things being tested, but there's nothing, nothing ready to go in humans, even in a preliminary fashion, we are still talking some years away, and they may they may not live up to the to the hype. But there's a lot of work on these ongoing. It maybe it does come to something.